Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mining Now. I'm your host, Jared Downey, and today we're going to have Boimer Group back featured on the episode. We've done several with them, and we're just continuing to pull back the layers of conveyor design. This, we're going to look at the holistic design of a conveyor system, um, especially um, these long systems that are so prevalent in the mining industry. So we're going to have Gabriel Moniz on. He is the engineering and operations manager at Boimer Group. Gabriel, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Thank you, Jared. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there, There is quite a bit to cover in the world of conveyors. So I guess I'll start off with the first question. When you're talking about the holistic conveyor design, um, we're talking right from the initial concept before they even know necessarily the map of where that conveyor is going to go. Is that right when we're saying holistic? Is it right from Greenfield? That that is that is correct. Uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, the holistic view, uh, you know, it applies to, you know, not not only looking at the equipment uh, itself, but everything infrastructure related uh, that is associated with this conveyor. What is your role? Um, I, it's it's always a good thing to start with. Is is what is your and I always I'm starting to ask this more in like a two part question. Your overall sort of mandate in the role, but also what's your day to day with Boimer? Sure. Uh, well, I'm I'm Boimer's engineering and operations manager uh, in North America. So in in very quick terms, I like to say that I. I'm here to add value from the sales to the execution phase, focus on, on engineering processes and engineering uh, design solutions. The, we're going to get into some of the design and showing value, but conveyors are quite unique, especially in the mining space, because no one conveyor is the same, especially with these like overland type uh, conveyors. Is it... In your role, are you still surprised? <laughs> do, you, do you still see a new project and go, "Oh, well, that's new. We haven't seen this one before." Well, that that's an interesting question, Jared. And you know, especially when we're talking about long distance conveying, mm -hmm. it, we don't have two conveyors that are the same. You know, every project is unique, and I think a lot of this uniqueness nature has to do with them mining nature as well mm -hmm. you know and considering that you know mines are located at remote areas different countries different regions uh different project requirements different weather conditions uh different land rights um so you know that's why you know some of this overland or long distance conveyor projects are so unique well i want to talk about some of those complexities um before going into sort of develop guiding the the client through the value that you're offering but there is so much to consider um and, and can you sort of expand what do you think let, let's let's pick maybe the top two challenges that may, maybe and i don't know what they are so you know the construction management um the yeah making sure that the right of ways like these things that you've listed out what is the most uh, and if we don't go with challenging, what takes the longest to develop? There is really no easy answer here. And again, it's connected with the uniqueness of each one of the conveyors. But uh, especially long distance conveying, you know, you, you can very rarely say that the equipment cost is the major cost driver. Mm. Uh, you know, here you have a system that's crossing you know, miles and miles of, of, of land and, you know, you have to acquire the land, you have to permit the project, and then you have to do earthworks uh, and typically removing a lot of dirt to make sure that you have, you know, a conveyor cord or a path that is suitable for a conveyor. Uh, so, and that goes back to our holistic approach. Uh, you know, the fact that we have this piece of equipment that does not show up on the back of a truck Right. This is an equipment that spans for for kilometers, for miles. Mm. And some of these aspects like land acquisition, permitting, you know, sometimes relocating existing uh, uh, villages or, or communities that are along with with this conveyor routes. All this have, you know, a huge impact in the project. 
Let's talk about our heavy industry tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide. We are heading to events across North America, Africa, and Australia, and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at crownsman.com to be part of our Crownsman's Heavy Industry World Tour. Okay, so let's give a special thank you to one of our longest sponsors of the show, Savannah Equipment. And I'm actually going to hand it over to Jared so that he can give you a little bit more info on Savannah Equipment. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's Yeah, so I mean, people see them as sponsors, so they'll ask me, you know, kind of who they are, what they are, and just trying to understand the scope of the company. So Savannah Equipment is a mining supply company, and they're delivering on the whole equipment supply chain. So everything from the ore processing to underground mining, open pit, they're in hard rock and placer operations. And what they're doing is they're sourcing equipment from all over the world and then delivering it all over the world. Now, they are a Canadian company, so they're based there. But, you know, let's say, I mean, they're selling entire ore processing plants. So there might be a plant down in Latin America, and there's a new mine that needs that plant in Africa or somewhere in the U.S. So they're facilitating that entire transaction. But they're also delivering, you know, an individual conveyor or a concentrator or a pump package, or just an electrical package. So it really is the whole gambit of the mining equipment supply chain. Oh, well, that's great then. Well, then you definitely have to check them out if you're looking for mining equipment. Visit them at SavannahEquipment.com, where you will find more equipment every day. The metals and mining industry bears a significant responsibility for meeting the dual challenge of growing demand for resources and rising standards of living from an increasing global population, while also addressing the sustainability goals of the future. Aspen Technology is here to partner with industry leaders and help them achieve those objectives with solutions in areas of advanced process controls and asset performance management that utilize artificial intelligence and machine learning to optimize their mining operations for both profitability and environmental responsibility. With Aspen Tech, you'll not only reduce downtime and improve safety, but also minimize waste, lower emissions, and improve operational efficiencies. Their expert team is always available to provide support and guidance, ensuring that you reach your operational and sustainability goals. Aspen Tech, empowering the metals and mining industry to meet the dual challenge. Learn more at AspenTech.com. The Maintenance, Engineering, and Reliability Mine Operations Conference and Trade Show, MIMO, is back in Saskatoon September 17th to 20th. Join us for live interaction with maintenance engineers and mine operators. This year, the theme of MIMO 2023, The Next Level, reflects the significant changes to the industry in the past few years. Registrations are open. Visit MIMO2023.cim.org to register and explore sponsorship and exhibit opportunities. So where is Boimer coming in in that case? Because if you're looking through land acquisition, I would imagine it'd be a pretty big error if you thought the conveyor should go, and I'm sure this has happened, where you think the the, the, the operator thinks the conveyor is going one place, and then I actually I think I saw on a slide on a presentation you did, um, like different routes, different options for the best, the most efficient way to move it. So are you coming in and saying, okay, this this is the best place for it, and then that company now has to go out and try to make those acquisitions and those adjustments? Well, th this this happens in, in stages and phases. Obviously, you know, when we start discussing a project uh, with the client, you know, typically they tell us, they give us an overview of, of what is the land mm -hmm. uh, condition, what can be acquired, what can be permitted, and right. what cannot, which are the obstacles that we have to try to to avoid and, and you know and, and this conversation involves evolves into you know developing real uh, bell calculations you know considering now the equipment tonnage and and really trying to make sure that within uh, you know the tech the technical requirements that are given we can find a route that is balancing you know the land acquisition side of things the permit is permitting side of things as well as the earthwork side of things and the equipment side of things so you know we really have to juggle lots of balls and 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 and, and that's why again we come back with the holistic approach you know those are those are fairly large infrastructure type of projects mm -hmm. and and you know as such they take they take years to develop as such you know we see they, they're complex by nature and we see clients wanting to be you know they're they are they, they, for them it's more important that they that we demonstrate a trade-off mm -hmm. it's more important that we 
demonstrate uh, pros and cons of different approaches than really, you know, that we try to focus on the equipment and maximize or minimize the cost of the equipment, which could, you know, later cost more in Earthworks or land acquisition. And right. Whatnot. Created and designed by industry leaders with decades of frontline experience, Sophie is a platform that brings workers home every day. Give your workforce the communication tools they need on the job to do it safely and productively. Visit Sophie.com today to discover how you can leverage Sophie to increase efficiencies, mitigate risk, and optimize collaboration. Safer, smarter, Sophie. HF Sinclair, which includes the PetroCanada Lubricants brand, is a proud sponsor of the show. PetroCanada Lubricants products and services are proven to maximize equipment performance, productivity, and overall savings. From heavy-duty engine oils to hydraulic fluids, ATFs, gear oils, and greases, PetroCanada Lubricants is committed to delivering innovative solutions that deliver value and keep businesses moving. They have dedicated technical expertise, knowledge, and know-how to help customers in the mining industry operate smoothly with improved equipment reliability and performance, and help support a mining operation. ESG goals. Learn more at lubricants.petro-canada.com or contact them at 1-866-335-3369 to arrange a call with one of their technical experts. With Fender Dunlop, you know you are getting the best conveyor belting in the market. That's because they ensure the integrity of their conveyor belting by monitoring each step of the manufacturing process in their North American facilities. Focused attention is given to each belting order to guarantee that they produce a belt that will assist the customer in reducing operation costs, maximizing uptime, and improving revenue. Visit FenderDunlopAmericas.com to learn more. Right. So that that's a very interesting thing. So really, even in presentation, you almost have to take that extra time to show those trade-offs because the it's if they don't they don't know what they're comparing it to if you just come in and said this is how we're going to do it this is the best way they don't have a comparison to tell them why it's the best way is that what you're getting at correct that that's correct so now going to value we, we've already sort of merged into that but when you're going through value let's go Let's go the first week of talks because once you're in it and you're presenting and you're, the engineering side's coming in and that now you're sort of into it with the client. But that first week, I'm really curious about it because there's it's you're just starting to get through the process. What does that look like? And I mean, really, that's like first week of you know they they. Maybe even they haven't confirmed what they want to do, like how engaged they're going to be with you as a group yet. What does that look like? What are those conversations like before the work actually gets started? Uh, we, we, we have developed a process uh, in which, you know, we put, we put the 3D topographic visualization kind of as a center point of our process. Mm -hmm. So it, it is very important for us to really understand the landscape and what we're dealing with, right? This this runs in parallel with the equipment requirements, and and here we're talking about you know the design capacity and the material properties. Uh, again, we we truly put the the understanding of the topographic uh, condition as as a starting point. Mm. Uh, so sitting with a client and understanding the terrain and what he he's trying to accomplish is extremely important. You know, later on, we will plug in various variables that will give us better direction on what makes more sense and less sense. And here we're talking about variables that are related to cut and fill costs, right? Sometimes, you know, they can fill inexpensively, but it's very uh, expensive to cut. Maybe they have a, an extremely competent rock within the terrain and it's just too expensive to drill and blast. Mm -hmm. So they want to, you know, instead of wanting a balance, you have a balance earth, a, a balance cut and fill type of condition. They want to offset things more to fill and have less, you know, it's a conversation, you know, as you develop, as you gather uh, more attributes and more variables uh, from the project that they're, typ they're typically very ex uh, specific. That's how the project evolves. Could you give us an example then? Because again, to make it to make it real world, I think that's very helpful for the audience. Um, I was looking at one. I think uh, in the notes that we got sent, there's one. It's, it's over six thousand tons per hour. It's over six kilometers long. 
Um, and there's actually even breakdowns on, well, like you said, it, in contrasting how much uh, fill costs you're reducing, you actually uh, have that in a presentation. Can you walk us through a project like that and just sort of paint that picture of, of what it takes? Sure. Uh, you know, on, on, on that specific project, we, we took the initial approach of, of trying to uh, balance the volume of cut with the volume of fuel as much of, as we could. And we also try to keep the conveyor uh, at grade for as long as we could. So uh, I just, I started to jump in, but uh, the, when you say reduce cut, what is that pertaining to specifically? What is cut? So I'm talking about uh, earthworks. I'm talking about removing dirt from okay. a place because the conveyor cannot, you know, go on this, you know, imagine that you have a kink on the, you know, in your terrain, it's just too, uh, it's just too jagged for the conveyor to go up and down. So you have to essentially cut material, remove material from that location. Okay. So you can smooth out the belt line. Just, I, I think this would be a good way to put it. Smooth out the belt line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So in this example, you, you found reductions in multiple streams then. So, yeah, no, what happened was that we focus on, on balancing the volume of cut with the volume of fuel. We came up with a belt line that was, again, balancing volume of cut and volume of fuel. And at the same time, it, it, it kept the belt uh, at grade for, for as long as we could. Because uh, another, another important cost uh, factor here as well is that you don't want to have a conveyor that's fully elevated. A conveyor that's fully elevated mm. on trusses and galleries right. is going to be way more cost intensive because you're going to have a lot more steel than if you have a conveyor at grade. So on that particular uh, project, what happened is that we, we began with this idea that the cut and fill costs, they were similar and that we should shoot for this, this even split between cut and fill. But it turned out that the cost for cut was like five times higher than the cost for fill. And what we ended up doing within this particular section of the conveyor was we left the belt line. And this is kind of counterintuitive because by lifting the belt line, you are adding a lot more fill. And we not only did this, but we replaced the fill with elevated structure another counterintuitive type of, of, of design approach. Yeah, because However, this is in comparison by, to the cut. The cut is going to be so cost-heavy. Yeah, okay. Correct. So, so here we did, we, we increased, the belt, increased the belt line, mm -hmm. so we increased the amount of fill, but drastically reduced the amount of cut. And then, if that wasn't enough, we replaced the amount of fill by elevated structures. So, you know, as far as the added cost for the fill versus the cost for steel structure, uh, that was kind of a wash. Mm. But on top of that, we reduced a very high volume of cut, we, which, you know, if I remember correctly, led to a savings of almost $5 million. Again, it was, we, we ended up, because of understanding the, project specifics parameters, like the cost for cut and fill, uh, we were able to take, well, we took two unconventional design approaches that ended up leading to, you know, overall cost savings. If this makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it does make sense. And, and I'm curious, and now jump, jumping back to the client side of that, when you're presenting that, is that a pretty... I mean, maybe not this specific, you know, we're not, we're not trying to call anybody out or anything, but um, do clients, because Boimer has so much experience, is that a hard thing to communicate? I mean, of course, you've already done it. So from me sitting here, I go, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's great. But while you're actually in that process, and maybe, they, maybe there's someone on their team that has a, in their mind, they go, well, if we elevate and fill, we're going to add so much cost. If that's their expectation... Is that ever a challenge to communicate when you're kind of going beyond outside of what their expectations were at the start of the process? Yes, yes, that, that's that's typically the case. Uh, but here we have a special, another special uh, skill set here, Bec and and because we we have this engineering process that is extremely centered on 
the visualization, the 3D visual, mm -hmm. visualization of your topographic conditions, we create uh, we create animations, we create renderings, and we're able to demonstrate in a very visual way what we are accomplishing. You know, this is this is very powerful and useful not only when you're having engineering discussions mm -hmm. uh, with the client, but this is also helpful for the clients as they have to navigate all their stakeholders. Oh uh, yeah, right within their projects, be it internal stakeholders or external stakeholders, right? Typically they have, you know, again, this goes back to the fact that this is very long, goes through communities. And, you know, when we are able to provide to them this, this animations and this 3D renderings, it makes their life much easier to demonstrate to their stakeholders what we're planning to do. I want to go talk about like very like we we talked about in mining specifically how how challenging some of it is. I think one of the first episodes we did with Boimer was about like shipyards, and that was a complexity because you got conveyors going over top of another conveyor. It was sort of like this sort of fitting it in a space that was a big challenge, uh, and it was very interesting um, and like dust reduction and things like that. But in mining, it's very much literally conveying it. <laughs> through mountains and down mountains and across it. Do you have any examples that are specific to that, maybe on the copper ore side, that are just sort of really significant challenges and really require that sort of that next level uh, to get the get the job done in the way that the client needs it? Yeah, I, I think, well, my response to, to that question, Jared, is that, you know, mining projects are uh, becoming more and more complex for for many reasons uh you know I, I think the public in general uh does not understand the efforts and the time that it takes to build a copper mine from from scratch mm -hmm. and and so there's a lot of push for extending the life of of, of existing mines rather than uh rather than building new mines and and with you know extending the life of mines comes lots of transportation challenges because now they are expanding their pits or opening you know adjacent pits and again this push put pressures on this put pressure on the transportation needs of a certain mine um, and and you know I think I think what we're doing here and what we're offering here uh, comes very handy uh, for the time that we're living in so these new so when they these mines are expanding then are they do they have existing infrastructure that you're is, is it a case of like in some cases repurposing or are you referencing complete a complete redo or both uh, of how they're set up yeah it goes you know every project is unique sometimes they can they can utilize existing infrastructures or they can utilize for instance existing haul roads and repurpose haul roads mm, to become right. you know conveyor corridors if you like uh, but you know each project is a project yeah, so I was looking at this one again. This this is a really nice slide you sent. Uh, this it's a copper ore project. It's eighty three thousand tons per hour, six point seven kilometers long. I'll I'll do my very non engineer view of it. It looks to me like you've got well, I, it looks like three or four different routes. Now I can't tell if you know the one I'm uh, referring to. Are are these are these all are these decisions to make these routes or are these all for, are these different routes that you have to actually put in? <laughs> so that, that, uh, that is a, a good example of optimizing a solution. So here we had a, a client that approached us with, uh, two, uh, possible conveyor routes. They were trying to connect. And again, this talks to the, to the, uh, uh, expansion or extending the life of existing mines. Here we have this client that has an existing processing plant mm. and is planning on opening a new a new pit. And, uh, and they, so they want to connect the new pit with the existing processing plant. I see. And and, and they came up with two uh, solutions or two alternatives as far as conveyor route. And and one interesting aspect here uh, is that 
you know, Boima has all this focus on on the civil 3D or the 3D topographic visualization of the conveyor routes and this 3D work, which is great, but we don't forget the basics. And, and here I'm talking about conveyor calculation basics, running your static calculations, running your dynamic calculations, and making sure that you have uh, the best design choices uh, for a given application. And, and here we were able to, you know, what we did for this given client, we were able to use horizontal curves that were more aggressive or tighter than the horizontal curves that the client had come up with originally. Sorry, what is the and term? Sorry, what is horizontal which? Horizontal curves. curves. So okay, this yeah. is horizontally curved uh, and the client had, you know, uh, selected curves that were uh, maybe a bit too conservative. And by mm. by doing what I said in terms of doing the basics and doing your you know, proper static calculations of a conveyor, proper dynamic calculations of a conveyor, we were able to use tighter curves. And by using tighter curves, uh, we ended up saving a lot of earth, earthwork. So we reduced the volumes associated with cut and fill by, by a great amount. And what's interesting here is that the savings that were achieved by reducing the earthworks were actually higher than, than the actual equipment cost. So th this, this brings us back to kind of the very beginning of our conversation where you know, for long distance conveyors, the equipment cost side of things are typically not the dominating mm. cost within a project. Yeah. So this is, yeah. And now I'm, I'm trying to remember, cause I, we've talked about all these different designs before, uh, having Boimer on. So I'd be fascinated. So, um, and I don't want to put you on the spot on this particular design, but with these these tighter curves in that, is it because of the design of the equipment components, though, that are allowing you to do those? I, I think I can remember that from our first interview. I mean, this is going back a few years ago now, um, or a couple of years anyway. Um, but is it, the, is it the advancement in the components that are allowing those tighter curves? Uh, it, it less, it's less about the component and more about a understanding of how mm. the belt behaves. It's, it's more about right. understanding uh, the belt tensions and be able to estimate the belt tensions with great accuracy. And, and that is combined with understanding how the belt behaves within the horizontal curves. So there is, there is a mix of, uh, theory with a lot of empirical uh, knowledge that is developed by building the systems and measuring systems mm. that were built to understand how uh, belt conveyors behave within horizontal curves. Is it ever such a difference? Has there ever been such an advancement? Uh, again, that's just a fun question for me, but <laughs> that um, where a mine has an existing and they just replace theirs because they it's for lack of a better term, just routed so poorly <laughs> that it's worth it to actually completely replace it to an existing point sure. eight, eight for existing point A to point B. It's just like they've rerouted it twenty years ago, just down the wrong spot of a mountain. I don't, I don't think I, I can, I can think of <laughs> of any specific case. Uh, you know, miners typically once they get their equipment running, they have yeah. to produce, produce, produce to pay off their debts. Yes. So, you know, sometimes it takes years. Obviously, systems are upgraded. Upgrades, yes. We've, you know, we've been involved with with a few upgrade upgrades and and uh, refurbished uh, refurbishment projects where conveyors were modified. Uh, but I can't mm -hmm. think of any, you know, conveyor that was put. And immediately realized that something could be done better. Oh no, I meant like twenty years later. I didn't mean like immediately. <laughs> not not that extreme, but yeah. The, but you are seeing. A, but you, what you're saying though, and I think this is an important thing just to key in on again, is that these mines, as as permitting new mines, is continuing to be a challenge, and hopefully that I, I can't see how that won't change here in the near future. But as it in our current state, it is. That they're they're like this mine that you're showing this last one. They're actually 
developing new pits and they need completely new routes just to get to their processing plant. It, that must be a huge part of your business right now, especially over the last 10 years. And that's correct. Uh, we've seen, I think I can comfortably say that we've seen a vast majority of, of conveyor projects being uh, projects where we are, uh, where the mines are expanding rather than, than greenfield mines. Right. And this is sort of tying it all together. Uh, but the automation um, that you've put into your designs and your engineering systems, um, it can you just expand on that a bit more? Because, I again, I think for anybody watching, just having that understanding, and, and again, you sent me these these really nice slides, so you have actually provided visualization. And then there's a whole bunch of like layout information that I honestly haven't been able to like, I haven't taken the time yet to like read through and understand. But can you lay out what that process is like? And of course, how that transfers to value for the clients in these projects? Sure. Uh, one, uh, one key aspect of our engineering process uh, especially when it comes to automation that that uh, I would like to highlight here is the fact that we we have this uh, focus on building a 3D belt line on an existing, you know, topographic model that was given to us. Mm. And, and from this belt line, we can build upon you know, our conveyor frames or trusses, and we can place sleepers uh, in, in, in space and have all that information extremely accurate and, and connected to real drawings. Uh, so what, what this does to us is the ability of, of really uh, generate uh, uh, lots of drawings with a great amount of detail mm. in a super short time. It, it, it not only expedite the execution uh, process, the engineering execution process, but it also allows for changes to be accommodated uh, a lot faster, right? I mean, again, we're, we're talking about conveyor systems that are kilometers long, miles long, and, and changes they do happen, right? Sometimes the creek wasn't wasn't surveyed properly, and you know as we get into execution, we find out that the creek is located a given creek is located, mm. you know, a few meters north or south uh, from where we we thought it would be, and this requires that the whole belt line and the positioning of the conveyor components mm -hmm. fall suit. So you know when you have a system that's automated to take on these changes, everything becomes super quick and super faster. How often are these changes? Um, for a, a given example of, you know, you, like you said about the creek, or you think there's a permit to go one, and then for some reason something changes and that permit gets pulled and it, or whatever it takes. How often is, like, what would be a typical, what would your expectation be of re having to redo this, this these 3D and the uh, engineering um, before it actually gets approved? Like, is it going through a hundred of these? Is it going through three? What would be a typical range? Uh, not an easy answer here, Jared, Jared again. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I like to think that we are bringing more and more uh, detailed, detailed information to the front end of the project so we're mm -hmm. we're being able to tackle more and more early on on the project project even though even though changes they 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 typically happen i mean those are infrastructure projects we're crossing land mm. uh there's really no magic number for me to give you like well we're going to have at least you know 10 route changes that that you know uh it wouldn't be possible but again they occur and all I can say is that Boima built the system where we can accommodate these changes a lot quicker. What's coming to mind as you go through this, um, and I'm going to take it outside of the the conveyor system. I'm going to let's jump right over to life. That if you make decisions with limited knowledge, you can actually make them quicker because you don't have all the variables in place, and but your chances of making a wrong decisions are higher. And so I think sometimes when we're talking as all this 
just all this technology and automation gets pumped into the mining industry, we're talking about specifically, is that it sometimes has a tinge that it's going to make the decision on the front end quicker. But I, I, I sometimes, especially hearing you go through it and, and like we're talking about making changes to the design and it strikes me as it might not be that way. You're actually taking longer in the front end in some cases because you have more variables and you can make a better decision that can take a little bit longer. Is that, is, am I on the right track with that? Yes, you are, Jared. I, I think your statement is uh, very true. I think uh, the appetite for more uh, knowledge, the appetite for more educated decisions early on in the project is growing. And I think this is positive. And I think that all this automation is allowing this to happen. So in other words, the front end is probably not getting shorter, but the front end is getting more accurate, which I think, you know, for the industry is positive. Well, things like, like, uh, you go into, well, budgeting for the project and then halfway through the project a piece of data was missing and i mean you're talking about doing cuts and fill and all that if that's miscalculated you're talking i mean you could talk, be talking an extra million bucks <laughs> just add it in because that was miscalculated um and you're really i would imagine with all this you're really starting to be able to eliminate those types of things yeah and, and that that's exactly what is happening i think we as an industry we're making more questions and we're chasing more answers right early on and i think the fact that we have systems that allow us to digest all that and come up with reasonably uh, quick solutions uh i, I see it as as, as positive I, and i think this is you know uh this is a a example of 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 uh industry moving forward that's for sure for in your experience i mean you've been in the industry a while has has there been in the last couple of years um and i'm going to preface this question with we of course when we're promoting companies on the show and talking through stuff it seems like this everything's like new and improved and of course you want to get people excited about it um but also things are slowly developed um over years and years and then they become mainstays in the industry they become standard in the last few years, have you seen an actual leap in technology? Has there been a jump? Um, or has it been that steady burn over the last 20 years? Just just from your, your personal perspective on the industry's development. I, I think we've seen, especially on the transportation side of things, and I'll not get into trucks, uh, but on the conveying side of things, I, I, I think we saw an incremental uh development more than anything mm -hmm. uh now which is which is positive yes incremental is not bad incremental improvement is good but on the not so bright side you know the industry is also uh you know lacking with with knowledge you know we see we see that there is really not enough conveyor engineers available mm. uh, there used to be more people so i think automation is not only you know, a good to have type of thing. It's it's kind of it has become a need because we have to do more with less right. available experience and, and manpower. Interesting. So that's that's a challenge specifically from the Boimer side is is and that this this modeling is helping you actually be able to still deliver what needs to get delivered even with I mean, everybody we talk to, finding people is just, it's such a challenge now. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon either. I agree. Gabriel, uh, it's, I appreciate you coming on. I mean, I know you have a ton of knowledge, and I, I hope some of my questions sort of at least facilitate you sharing that knowledge with our audience. What, to wrap up, what would you want, what do you want a key takeaway to be for mining operators, people that are watching that are maybe looking at it for their projects, or know people that are looking at projects, what would the key takeaways for you be? Sure, I think, I think the, the, the very first takeaway is that every project is unique and, and should be treated as such. Uh, I, you know, I also think that a key message that we try to convey here is that 
the conveyor equipment itself is, is it, it can be a relatively small portion of the overall project cost. And, you know, with that said, you know, taking this holistic approach when, when designing uh, long distance conveyor systems can unlock uh, lots of savings. So I, you know, with, with that said, I think it's, it's always worth talking to, you know, a group of people that has built a lot of experience building the systems. Sir, we will leave it there. Thank you very much for coming on. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be having Boimer on again. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's lots of fun for me getting to, and I've said it many times on the show, but when people just come on once and then, you know, it's not a year or two before they come back, we don't really get to really dig in and our audience likes technical information. So thanks for taking the time and actually walking us through some of these projects because for sure that's what the audience likes. So appreciate it. Thanks, Jared. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for watching. Um, we've you've, a lot of our episodes coming out have been on site, um, you know, at, at events like CIM. But it is very nice to be back in studio and really be able to take our time because, again, you as the audience, you like the more technical we get, the more you watch. So we appreciate that, and we love doing those types of episodes. We will see you on the next episode of Mining Now. Mining Now.